Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so hopefully the slides will come up. Uh, so um, uh, just want to uh, remind you to install the application and rate the session and leave feedback. I do look at it. I will uh, try and follow up and improve the talks in future. So it's really useful to me as well as you can win a pencil, um, which is always quite nice. So uh, I'm Michael Brunton Spall. Um, my pronouns are he, his, and him. Um, I've been doing software development and security for about uh, 10, 15 years now. Uh, I've worked in the UK government uh, for a while, but I got better and became an independent consultant instead. Uh, it's far, far easier than working in government. I still do a lot of government uh, consulting and contracting, though. Um, I uh, worked with a couple of people to write a book on agile application security, and a bunch of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today is in there as well. Um, and I write a free weekly newsletter, which you might be interested in, which covers news stories of cybersecurity stuff um, that you might find. Um, and one of the things I've noticed over the last 15 years is that uh, agile software development has kind of changed the way that we write code. It's changed the way that we build software, and it's changed the way that we develop products. But very rarely are security people involved in that in any way, shape, or form. Security has kind of in many cases, fossilized and is one of the last big holdouts against the agile um, ways of working. And so I want to talk about a common thing I find, particularly going into government organizations, which is um, uh, the security people are like, but if you do that agile stuff, we'll be significantly less secure. And so I kind of want to talk about uh, what that is. But before I get there, I find that everybody I meet has a slightly different experience of what security means and what agile means and so forth. So I'm just going to very quickly talk about what I mean when I talk about agile. And the reason I say this is uh, I had a client not that long ago uh, went to go visit who were um, uh, went to go meet their software development team, and they were doing me a, a tour and showing me around and. Here's the cubicles where all our software developers work, and they're all there with their headphones on working away, and they're, here's our Agile Corner. And I was like, this is an interesting concept, an Agile Corner. And what they meant was they had a little glass wall with some Post-its on, multicolored Post-its, and they had some bean bags. And as far as they were concerned, they were now doing Agile. They released once every six months or so, and everybody worked independently off of the plan that had been developed two years before, but they had bean bags and Post-it notes, so they were Agile as far as they were concerned. Um, and to me, that's not Agile. I've been doing this for quite a long time, and that's not what Agile is about. That's not a really Agile team. But it's quite common for people to find the Agile things and do them. Another team I went to go meet, I went to go meet a, a government departmental team. And they, had, uh, they came to, to show me their project plan. It was a um, large defense organization. They came to show me the project plan, and they explained that they were doing Agile. They were going to build their project over two years. They were going to start with eight sprints of design planning, followed by eight sprints of requirements writing, followed by 27 sprints or so of development and software code writing. And I was like, I don't think you quite understand the purpose of it. Like, we've divided it into two-week chunks, and we'll, do, we'll, we'll deliver a new updated bit of requirements at the end of each two weeks. So that's agile, right? I was like, that's not what it is. So uh, I like to take agile right back to the very basis of Agile, which is it's about the Agile manifesto. It's about individuals and interactions over process and tools. It's about saying that the people on the team who know what they're doing and the way they interact with the customer, with gathering requirements from users, with engaging with design, is far more important than them following the process or using a specific tool. Just because you've purchased IBM's RUP Rational Unified Process um, tool doesn't mean you have to use it for everything. It's more important that the individuals are able to actually get on and do their job. It's about working software over comprehensive documentation. It's about saying, if I can ship some software and put it in front of somebody, I can get feedback on it straight away, which is far better than if I show them a written description of what the software will do and get some feedback that, oh, I'd quite like it if that little logo was blue and that thing's there. But they didn't use it. They didn't get to interact with it. And that's all about customer collaboration over contract negotiation. It's about ensuring that you can actually talk with your users. You can find out what it is that they do. You can conduct research on your users and find out how they use your actual software. The first time I watched somebody interact with a government service, we had a user research lab. So we went to go see it. We got six people in and said, please sit down and pretend you're filling in this form to claim a government benefit. And I watched them use it. And this, this, um, uh, this young lady came in, and she had been made unemployed. And we were talking through how she would claim some of these benefits. And she sat down, and she looked at the form. She filled in the first two fields. And she just looked at it being like, I don't know what to do next. And they were like, you have to scroll down a bit. And she was like, 
scroll. I don't know what that is. And this was a young lady who was 23, 24. It's very easy for us to say, oh, old people don't know how this stuff works. But this young person just didn't know how to scroll the screen. And we had a form that was about 30 form entries all the way down the field. You had to continuously scroll the form. And she would move the mouse pointer over to the right-hand side of the browser, click and, click and press the down button repeatedly to get it go down line by line by line to reveal the next field. Then she'd type, move back, type that in, move back. And it was the first time I'd seen real people interact with the things that I build. And it was the first time I suddenly went, she has no idea what a scroll wheel is. I can, I can never put that into a requirements document to say, this needs to be easy to fit in a single page. But the moment you see somebody using it, you get benefit from it. And finally, as, as was uh, really well explained this morning in the keynote, it's about responding to change over following a plan. I like a Gantt chart. I, 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 you know, I'm a budding project manager. I have to do Gantt charts for all kinds of reasons. I've never seen a Gantt chart that is not, in fact, a complete fantasy map of what people wish would happen. Most project plans show what we think will happen. It's useful to articulate your thoughts about what might happen in the future. It's a good tool. But at the moment, you start saying, well, we're now eight weeks from when I drew that Gantt chart. The whole world has changed, but I still want you to be at this point on it, and you're not, and that's not good. It's not there. The problem we have with a lot of security is that security really is about processes and plans and contracts. And a lot of security people are like, if you're not going to do those things, we're not going to be secure. And in reality, I'd like, I spent ages trying to find a really good definition of security. And everyone has a very different definition in their head. The ISO 27001 definition is that security is, um, uh, is a process for assuring the preservation of confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. If you're not asleep already, um, like, it is the dullest definition it's possible to have. But that is what a lot of security people think it's about. It's about how can I assure the preservation? Like, it's not even, there's not even a good verb in that sentence. It's, it's not a very useful thing. And so my argument when people come to me and say, if you do Agile, if you respond to change and change what you're doing every two weeks, if you talk to your customers rather than following the contract, if you worry about tools, uh, worry about people and interactions rather than your process, you are going to um, uh, not do the security process that we've written down. We've written down this wonderful process, and you're not going to follow it. And that's going to cause all kinds of problems. Well, my first argument against that is, I don't think security in that form works at all. Like, We've been following it for a long time. And you would think we've been getting better at it. So I'm going to take you back in time. I'm going to take you back in time uh, nearly 20 years, 15 years or so. I'm going to take you back in time to 2006 or late 2005. So this is a visualization from uh, Information is Beautiful, which is a lovely set of infographics that get put together uh, by a guy called uh, David McCandless. And he put together all the breaches over time. And every time there's new information security breaches, he puts them up on here, and you get a lovely visualization. And back in 2005, 2006, we had one of the first, oh, wrong button. Um, we had one of the first um, uh, uh, big breaches that we, we have good records for, which is 92 million records from AOL. Does anyone remember AOL? You had to sign up. You got a CD. They made really great coasters because you got so many of them. Um, the uh, AOL had 92 million users. I'm shocked that it was that many users, but 92 million users signed up. And one of the, um, one of the systems admins decided they would make some money on the side by selling the email address of every single user who'd signed up to AOL to a spammer who could then, um, uh, who could then spam the, uh, the list and send, try and sell them Viagra, I think it was. Um, and they were caught, and they were fined, and they lost more money than they made out of it. But that was a, that was a big breach. And we've got a couple other breaches up here. We get bits and pieces, US Department of Veteran Affairs, KDDI, Hewlett Packard. This one up here is famous in UK government circles. So the UK Revenue and Customs, for, that's the tax man for, for those who aren't um, British nationals. Um, they had a, a system called the Child Benefit System. If you have a child and you are on benefits in any way, shape, or form, you're able to gain uh, a small amount of money each week. And they had a record of all the children who were in these vulnerable households. Somebody in London decided that they needed this database up in uh, Shipley, up uh, in the north of England. Uh, and so they burnt them onto two CDs. They just went to the database in the SQL command. They did export the whole data, the plain text file. They burnt it onto two CDs. They put the CDs in the post, and they didn't turn up at the other end. And that was, uh, that was a huge number of records um, that were just lost in the post somewhere. Nobody knows what happened to them. Sensitive details about lots of children across the UK. The head of UK Revenue and Customs had to resign. 
That was some junior administrator somewhere just decided to type the words in, put it in, and the head of the organization lost their job over it. So you'd think we'd learn from that. The, the UK government has still not recovered. The security um, issues inside the UK government are still caused by the loss of those CDs, all the things we have to go through. But you'd think we'd get better. So as we fast forward to 2010, things start to get a little better. We're getting better at security. We're going to have less breaches. Oh, no, wait. We're going to have significantly more breaches. We get exciting people, like the US military lost a whole bunch of um, uh, information, 76 there. You've got Sony PSN hack. Uh, that was uh, North Korea, for those of you who remember, uh, decided to uh, take out Sony uh, Online Entertainment. You've got LinkedIn, 117 million. The NHS up here. The NHS, that's the National Health Service in the UK government. They had a... Um, clinical record system in which uh, they kept trials for medical data. So people who'd decided to have their toe cut off for science and find out what, how it affected their balance. All their details we put in, photos, medical records, very personal data. They put it all on these laptops. They put the laptops in a storeroom overnight. When they came back the next day, 40 laptops were gone. And they were like, oh, yeah, there was a lot of data on those laptops, and none of it was encrypted. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't really learn. Um, we've got uh, up here somewhere, I've lost it, it's up here. Uh, we have got, um, where's the other one? Snapchat up there, Steam, uh, US law enforcement. I thought there was one here, it's on the next slide, I think. Um, so if we move forward to 2013, things are getting better. We're getting better at security. It's been, it's been what, eight years now? We should have learned by now how to do security. We know how to do security. We know how to do security really well. People like eBay, 145 million records. Target, 70 million records. Yahoo, half a billion records. Yahoo trying for the, uh, the, the most records lost ever. Um, Adobe over here, 36 million records. They had stored the passwords for all of the Adobe online um, services in a database, and they had not hashed those passwords properly. So if I had the password, uh, 123456, and you had the password 123456, they would both be the same value in the database. You couldn't see that it was 123456, but you could see that we all had the same ones. And so you could look them up and say, this is the most popular, this is the next most popular. They also include in that same database the password hint. So you know when sometimes you set a password and then you get told, give yourself a hint that you can use to guess it. Well, it turns out if you know that 50 people have got the same password. You don't know what it is, but you do know they've got the same password. But you can see 50 different hints that say, my dog, my dog with an R, my dog sounds like Bova. You can start to get an idea of what that password actually is. And somebody's put together, you can find it online, I don't have a screenshot, I'm afraid, of the, um, the Adobe password crossword. And the idea is it gives you all the little hints, and you type in the, the word. And if you get it correct, it will then light up. And you can go through three, 400 of these crosswords trying to guess at the passwords from the hints. I will warn you, it's uh, scarily easy um, to detect them. Um, you've got uh, JP Morgan Chase, big finance company, Mozilla. Mozilla, uh, this is green because it's an internal engineer causing a breach. Uh, they accidentally took their, um, uh, their production uh, sign-in system and uh, dumped the database and put it into GitHub so that everybody's usernames and passwords were included in GitHub uh, for anybody to go download uh, as part of their production to development backup. Um, all of these companies keep doing it, but it's okay. It's 2013. We're definitely going to get better. We're getting better. It's 2018, and, and oh, yeah, we're getting quite bad. Um, this one down here, I don't know what happened with the rendering here. I think this is so big that it couldn't actually uh, render, and so it rendered really, really small. Ardha is the Indian National's biometric database. So if you would like to sign up, if you are a citizen in India, you have a record in Aadhaar. And I'm trying to remember if I've got the actual number in here. I don't. Um, it, that is a big number. I think it's over a billion records uh, of people's biometrics lost, as well as their personal details, their government details, and so forth. And it turns out the Indian government allows more or less any commercial company who has to do something with the government to connect to Aadhaar to check details, doesn't rate limit it. And so lots of companies would just essentially spamming it and downloading the entire database by requesting every record one after the other. Um, don't do that. It's a really bad thing. Uh, Anthem Health over here, which was a health insurer in, 20, uh, in 2016. We've got Yahoo again. Twitter, 330 million records. That was actually, that's green again, because that was passwords were being put into the logs. So when you tried to log in, um, it would log password X type successfully, and it got dumped into the logs, which turns out it's a really bad idea, because now your engineers can see everybody's password if they go and have a look. Um, uh, my Fitness, Firebase, and so forth. And this is just a record of the breaches that we know about. These are just the news stories that we talk about. Because the internet's a deep and scary place. And just like anywhere else, you occasionally get criminals in deep and scary places. You get criminal users who use the internet. Criminal use of the internet is worth around $1.5 trillion a year. 
that is not somebody in their bedroom with a hoodie and an anonymous mask on their face. I know the media likes to show us that hackers look like that, but it's $1.5 trillion. That's real money. So to give you an example of that, I'm going to wind back in time again. So um, how many of you have heard of Drydex? Does the name Drydex mean anything to anyone? Um, or Dyer? So these are uh, TrickBot and Drydex are more recent uh, banking trojans. They basically, you get infected with a piece of malware, and it steals your bank details and sends all your money to somewhere else. Um, but actually, they've got a long history, and they go all the way back to 2007, a thing called Zeus. And the one we're actually going to look over is actually this one called Game Over Zeus from 2011. So Zeus was a standard piece of malware. You, uh, you get it onto somebody's computer, and it will um, uh, run on their computer and, and do arbitrary commands. And what it would do is it would look and see when you browse to a bank website, it would replace bits inside your browser with new fields that ask you things like your complete credit card number and the PIN number. But as a user, you feel like you're engaging with your bank. This is a trusted page that you chose to navigate to. So of course, if they ask for your card PIN, they know it, and they'll say, yes, you wrote that in successfully. But in the, on the back side, this, this malware is taking it from your computer and sending it elsewhere. What Game Over did was, um, uh, was one of the first changes to that, which is it turned it into a peer-to-peer -peer network. So instead of just having to hand write the malware yourself, that it specifically targets Bank of America and then send it out to people. What happened is it comes with its own little scripting engine. It's actually quite a neat little scripting engine. Um, you can find Game Over Zeus on GitHub, by the way. It's open source. Uh, so if you want to have a look at how malware is written, you can find it on there. Um, and it works like this. You get a piece of uh, script that comes with it. So uh, this script sets, says, uh, when they go to a URL that matches this, uh, before the name, the text password bit of um, uh, code, inject the following thing. So ask for your PIN number with the PIN number. Now, you'll notice that these malware writers, not only do they, um, uh, not only do they uh, know how to write their HTML, they're actually doing it in quite good HTML5. That's a good input tag. That's good. They've even put data after and closed the TR, because they close their tags like good, proper web developers. Um, the interesting thing about this is not that somebody with malware can now change the behavior of the malware on any given machine. It's that the person who infects somebody's machine no longer has to actually commit the, uh, commit the crime. They can just rent out people who are infected. And in fact, that's what happened. With Game Over, they, uh, you would get malware developers and you would get um, spammers who would infect people, and they would build up this peer-to-peer -peer network of computers. And you would be able to go to the dark market place where they sold it and say, I would like to buy access to run my scripts for two days on only people who bank with Bank of America Online. And they would say, OK, you send us the script. We will roll it out to our botnet of people, and you can do it. You can say, I only want to target people with a net worth of more than one million. Or I want to target people with a net worth under 200,000, because I know I'll be able to take small amounts of money from them instead. Um, this is what's sometimes called platform capitalization. Um, that is essentially, it is the Uber of cybercrime. It is the case where somebody has said, there is a gap in the market. Right now, you have to write malware, get it on somewhere, and steal the money. But now, I can inject as a middleman, and I can just rent out people's bank accounts to criminals. And I make money for just renting out. I don't have to get the money out of their bank account. I don't have to do all of the other stuff. We can also call it cybercrime as a service. And there's a great uh, um, research paper by Bromium that you can read. Um, but essentially, the reason for it is, is that actually getting money off of people when you've infected their computer is quite hard, because you have to get the malware on there. But then even if you get into their bank account, you have to work out where you're going to send the money. Like, if I, if I broke into your bank account and sent the money to my bank account, I think the bank would notice all the money coming into my bank account. And you would say I was robbed, and I would be uh, picked up. And so instead, you have to find all these things, like you have to transfer it to money mules, and they have to do international transfers, and you get those into the organization. If you want to transfer it somewhere interesting, you have to set up a completely fraudulent company that has to have a company bank account that you can then close down with no sign of who the directors were, where the money went. You can use it in other kinds of uh, fraud and fun uh, and so forth. This is quite complicated. And the reason that this becomes important is that 1.5 trillion is spent on a dependency map of a lot of different services. The actual fraudsters, the malware deployment, the person who's doing, uh, running the malware, is reliant on people who can actually code the malware, because it's actually quite hard to write malware. It's not the simplest thing in the world. Um, but people who can code malware have a different skill set to people who can bypass antivirus, for example. If you want to bypass modern antivirus systems, you need polymorphic code. You need to detect resistance against certain types of um, uh, uh, things it looks for, looks for processes doing odd things in different ways. So you might have to go buy counter antivirus tools. You literally take your executable, 
put it in there, and it'll wrap it, and it'll change a bunch of the calls and may then hide it. Um, you also need to um, get traffic. You need uh, you can pay per install, so you can go out and get spammers to install it on a whole bunch of machines, so you don't have to do the install yourself. Um, you've got inject writing. The people who actually write those those scripts, um, a lot of Criminals aren't necessarily that intelligent. They're not technically trained. Some of them can't write those scripts, so they go to forums and say, if you just write the script, I will give you $1,000, and people will write the scripts. And then you've got cross-crime factors, things like uh, hosting, things like um, uh, DDoS protection, VPN proxy services. One of the most interesting things is support services. If you bought Game Over at the time, you would get a Skype number you could ring where they would answer within two calls, which is faster than almost any government service I've ever seen. They would answer and say, oh, are you having difficulty with Bank of America? Yeah, they've just updated the HTML. You need to change your inject to say this. They had a professional call center that would respond to this. And that's before we get onto the big boogeyman. Has anybody heard of advanced persistent threats or APTs? A couple of people. This is a fantastic marketing term from companies that would like to sell you security products, essentially. Um, but APTs are what we call like advanced persistent actors. They are people on the national stage who have lots and lots of skills, lots of capability, and they want to get into all kinds of systems. So we have examples like this. This is APT41, who broke into Chinese telecom companies and um, I think Chinese telecom companies, uh, yes, and then they would watch for specific phone numbers, and if a phone number was being used, SMS messages, they would dump it out. Um, uh, and it's probably China is behind this, um, although uh, the report I is uh, slightly unsure as to whether it is at China or not, uh, but message tap is there. If you're running a telecoms company in uh, China, then you are probably being targeted by them. Um, Georgia uh, was hit by a massive cyber attack. Uh, I think 23,000 websites went down, um, mostly because uh, one major um, hosting provider was hit. Um, but the, uh, the implication was lots of people worried it was the Russians. It turned out it wasn't. It was actually a, um, uh, an independent hacking group. Um, India was targeted. India's nuclear power network was targeted by uh, malware that attempted to get onto the control network to have access to the nuclear control system, which is a terrifying thing to happen. Um, and then uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, two former Twitter employees uh, were charged with spying for Saudi Arabia because they were taking calls from um, the Crown Prince's um, uh, director and then looking for people on Twitter and finding their personal details uh, when Twitter would refuse to respond under the legal process. They would contact these insiders, a sysadmin who would use the internal tool to look up IP addresses and browsers and where the person had logged in from from Twitter. Um, one that I think is probably interesting to, to many of you is uh, something called Fin4. Now, Fin4 is a bit of an older one. They've shut down now. Um, but Fin4 were a financial uh, advanced persistent threat. They would target organizations going through mergers and acquisitions, primarily in pharmaceuticals, uh, but a few other areas, non-tech companies. And what they would do is they would send an email that uh, looked a bit like this. Uh, so you would send an email that says, here is a, a document that you would like to read, but you need to sign it. And then you would click through, you'd try to sign it, and that would actually run malware on your computer. Once they got that, they would send email from you to other people in your organization to spread. Now it's not coming from an external organization. It's coming from somebody you know. So people are far more likely to click it, enable uh, macros, and so forth. And they would, um, uh, Fin4, the interesting thing about them was what they were trying to do is they jumped the firewall from the company that was recently acquired to the advisors, the financial advisors, who had helped them be acquired. And once inside the advisors' things, they would look on future mergers and acquisitions that were going to happen that were not yet public. And then they would trade on the stock prices based on what those were to commit inside trading. So it's not just, you know, ooh, China's going to come get us. People do this for financial motive for all kinds of reasons, and many of our companies will do it. Um, what is it we have for defense? Why is it that I say the security doesn't work? What we have is certification. We have accreditation. We have compliance regimes. We have PCI. Has anyone had to have PCI compliance done in their organization? A couple of people. Anybody enjoyed it? Not the same hands. Uh, not the same thing at all. Uh, so PCI. We have ICI, uh, ISO 27001. Um, for those who haven't seen ISO 27001, this is a good diagram of uh, ISO 27001. If you would like to be secure, you have to implement all this security stuff. So uh, you need to inventory your information assets, define your ISMS scope. You'll put that into an inventory for your information security management system. You'll have regular compliance reviews, which will uh, cause many co uh, corrective actions. You will ensure that you have policies and standards and procedures and guidelines. The only thing on here that is actually related to developing or improving an individual project is at that point. At no point is this about helping your development team do anything in any way, shape, or form. This is purely about documenting that you are following a process. It does not matter if that process is a bad process, providing you follow it consistently, you will get your ISO 27001. 
And we have things like change control. Has anyone heard of ITIL? A couple of people. The UK government's very sorry. Uh, we wrote it. Um, so uh, ITIL is uh, change management. So the idea is that you're going to take a system, you'll have it running, and now you need to go through what's commonly called a, a change advisory board, or CAB, in order to get your change rolled out. And this is the description of the process. So first of all, your uh, service transition process. So this is not your development team. This is a separate team will evaluate your change, and they will form some project management to determine how long it will take to implement your change. They will um, work out what the release and deployment management process is and the service validation that's needed. They will pass it into this change management uh, system in which your change will be assessed by the change manager. Now, if it's an emergency change, you get to go straight to implementation. If it's a minor change, you get to go straight to implementation. If it is not, you have to go to a change advisory board who will work out change scheduling and build authorization, who will give you a change deployment authorization, who will run a, um, who will also work out the post-implementation review and change closure, at which point they will pass on to the service transition team who will actually do the change, release and deployment management. So none of this does anything in any way, shape, or form. It is purely about trying to get to this point. I went to go work with a government agency, um, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it later, but um, one of the issues that we had was I went to go look at their last three or four releases. They did not release very often. It wasn't that hard. We found hundreds of changes in the release. Not a single one had gone through this process. They were all either an emergency change that was sponsored by a senior executive, or they were a minor change that had snuck through because one of the developers did it. Everything that was queued for release in that deployment had failed to get through because so many emergency sponsored changes had gone through. Which tells you something terrifying when our change processes don't enable us to change. And who does this? Is this just you know, ridiculous organizations like government? Who, who takes security this seriously? Well, Facebook. Uh, managed to fail. To, they had to pull their data collecting VPN app from the thing. Um, NordVPN and um, what's the other one? ProtonVPN. Uh, Talos Security found vulnerabilities in VPN clients. You would think security companies who build VPN clients would, would have a secure process that ensures things aren't, aren't done. Um, Mac apps written by Trend Micro, one of the leading uh, security antivirus companies, uh, were stealing user data. And Trend were like, we're really sorry. That was an accident. It shouldn't have been released. Um, BA, British Airways. British Airways were, um, uh, uh, were done over by 22 lines of JavaScript that was added to uh, one of their systems. Um, they have an 11 billion pound revenues every year. And the last time I could find their budget, which was when their revenues were significantly smaller, they had 200 million pounds IT budget every year. And yet they got done over. Does anyone here have 200 million pounds IT budget every year or more? Very few of us. Um, uh, and T-Mobile, one of the biggest uh, telephone networks in the world, uh, had personal data stolen. Um, I, I, I love in this case that it was an incident with air quotes. It's, it's not that there was actually an incident and data was lost, which it was, but they have decided, they disclosed it as an incident with the air quotes, which is brilliant. So, security doesn't really work. Like, we've been doing it for a long time, and people will tell you, if you followed this process better, then we would be more secure. I've heard this before 10, 15 years ago when we started talking about doing Agile. And people said, if you just follow this process better, you wrote better requirements, we'd have better software at the end. But it wasn't true. It was never true. And one of the things we prove with Agile is it isn't true. The thing I would like to uh, talk about is the fact that simple systems are more secure. So I'm going to take a very quick detour down something called complexity theory. Has anybody heard of complexity theory? It's a common conference talk. Uh, yes, there's a couple of people here. So complexity theory basically says that as things uh, that we look at things in different levels of complexity. So uh, the Kinefin framework is a really good model for understanding complexity. So the idea is you might have things. I am not mechanically inclined. I am. I'm, I'm an IT person. I'm a security person. I don't like the outdoors in any way, shape, or form. There's no power. There's very little Wi-Fi. It's very upsetting to me. Um, but you get things like a bike. Now, that is what we consider to be a simple system. If I push on the pedal, the wheel goes round. If I push on the pedal, the cog goes round, which drives the other cog, which goes round. There's even gears on some of them, and I can vaguely understand the, the big one and the little one means more transfer of power. Even I can understand that. I am not mechanically inclined at all. But that is a simple system. If I put a certain amount of energy into the pedal, the wheel will go around a certain amount every time, guaranteed, pretty much. There's a bunch of physics you have to work out around tensions and stuff like that. But broadly speaking, you can model this exactly and know exactly how it works. But you get things like a car. A car is a complicated system. So a car has lots of different parts. And it's very hard to understand how it works. But in reality, a mechanic, not me, as far as I'm concerned, there's magic under the hood somewhere. I push on the accelerator, the car goes forward. No idea how it works. There's something to do with mini explosions. I'm sure it's safe. 
But a car is a complicated system. It is entirely possible for mechanics to understand exactly how that works. They will tell you that if you push on the accelerator this much, this much petrol will be sprayed into this cubic volume of the engine, which will cause this amount of force, which will go down the crankshaft, arc shaft, I don't know, the thing, and make the wheels turn. It's a complicated system that one can reason about in a sensible system. But traffic is not. Traffic is what we call a complex system. Traffic, when when little things change, the whole system changes, and it's entirely unpredictable. It's uh, some of chaos theory comes in here, some other things. And the way that we interact with the different systems has to be really different. When we're dealing with simple systems, we can reason about them, and we can say, we can plan, we can uh, work out what we're going to do, we can act, we can do, and then we can sense and check we've done the right thing. When we're dealing with complex systems, we have to do and then check what happened, and we have to build really fast feedback mechanisms that work. We don't solve mo motorway congestion. You know, if you've got a big motorway that's always blocked in the morning because everyone's commuting in. You don't solve it by checking that everyone's tires are the right length or that they have the right amount of tread or that everyone's car fits a certain thing. We do that for certain types of safety anyway to help improve the car, but that's not how we solve traffic congestion. We solve traffic congestion by making minor changes to the system as an interacting system and watching it. And why do I say this? Well, because microservices and security brings us to a very interesting place in this, this world. Um, uh, I think Sam and Newman's here and will be talking. Um, but Sam, and, uh, Sam worked with a guy called James Lewis uh, when uh, they were coming up with microservices. And James Lewis had what I thought was the best definition uh, of microservices. James said that microservices are software that can fit in my head. And he always says, my head's about that big, so if you're writing Java, that's a good, you know, that's, that's only one class and one tiny thing. If you're writing Python or Ruby, you can get quite a lot of stuff in there. But the point is, with a microservice, you should be able to look at it and understand how it works. It's broadly speaking a simple system. Each microservice can be reasoned about in a simple way. The, the systems working together form a complex system and you assure that in a very different mechanism because you have to do the sense and then determine what to do and then check what happened afterwards and go around that, that thing. So microservices are small systems. They're often focused on a single business domain. If you do them well, you've got one service worrying about identity and login, and one service worrying about inventory control, and one service worrying about invoicing and receipts printing, and, and so forth. Because they're business-based, they can talk to the business owners and understand the actual systems that the business does. And that's a really important thing for ensuring that security is not mixed up with all kinds of weird other bits and pieces. They own their own data, which is really important for when they get breached or when, they, uh, when you worry about how secure should the data be. You're not suddenly constrained with the database contains everything from people's credit cards to their login details to their, uh, what they purchased last week. You've got different databases, and that makes it easier to reason around. And they often have contracts of communication that help improve your security posture around the outside. I know that all the other mic will ask me for a user to log in in this manner. And I can start reasoning about what password will I get, what will I do about that stuff. So simple services with clear boundaries are far easier to secure. And microservices tend to go hand in hand with Agile for all kinds of reasons, primarily because the same people go to the same conferences every year. But um, they tend to go hand in hand. But they're easier to secure as well. The other thing I think is that security has to be an enabler for the team. Um, I'm going to stop and take a break. I do speak this fast all the time. I apologize. Um, Security has to be an enabler for the team. When I pointed out that ISO 27001 process earlier, the key thing that was there is that that is a process for process's sake. At no point in there is anybody trying to understand what the team is trying to do. Why do they want the change to happen? Why, is it, why does it matter that, that change happens? Security has to think about the fact that teams want to deliver value. They want to do stuff, particularly if they're agile teams. They're meeting their customers. They know what's going on with their customers. So one of the, one of the mandates we used inside the UK government was that the unit of delivery is the team, that the team is the people who get to make these decisions. So the unit of decision making has to be within the team. And in fact, we encoded this in a government standard that says when you are building teams, you must appoint a suitably senior and empowered decision maker. Somebody has to own any given service and be able to say, I am the authority for understanding the security implications of it, the fraud implications of it, whether it's up or down, the operational implications, the availability, is it accessible to people, does it work, does it actually deliver on what it's supposed to do in terms of a policy thing. And security, I think, then needs to become a part of that and help that team do it. It can't become a gatekeeper and say, you can't do anything unless you come through us and, uh, and approach us in the right way. So when I go and work with uh, teams, what we do is we workshop with the whole team. And I'm going to add a slight caveat to that, which is you workshop with as much of the team as you can fit. Some teams are 80 people. It's impossible to get a workshop. But you need representatives from different areas. 
I would normally say you need at least three representatives in, in, a, in a given security workshop. You need somebody from security, you need somebody from the business who actually cares about what the service does, and you need somebody technical from the team who can represent the, the, the delivery function of the team. So I have a good example of this in a workshop I ran uh, with a government agency recently. Um, you, can, you can tell the business person because uh, he's wearing a shirt, and you can tell the developer because, uh, A, he's very casual, very cool, and he's um, uh, sitting on a desk, you know, very developer, very cool. You can tell the security person because he's the only one wearing a lanyard um, and making sure he's actually wearing his own entity card. And also, he's got his back to the camera, so his face isn't photographed. But we get the three people together. We get them to talk to one another, individuals and interactions over process. We get them to talk about what are you worried about in this service? What is the concern? The concern is that somebody's going to steal money, somebody's going to steal data, somebody's going to do something. How do we get people to get to a position where they go, this is the thing I'm really worried about? We produce visible outputs for the walls. Agile teams love their post-its and their, their um, other things, but we produce things you can put on the walls that help the rest of the team understand what security conversations happened. So a really common one that we use is anti-personas. Has anyone seen personas? Have you seen personas, design personas? So the idea is a couple of people. The idea is you, you build up an idea of what are my users and maybe what are the categories of users. So I might have Cheryl, who is a, a self-employed business owner who just wants to file her taxes in this way. And you might have Sandy, who is a, a, a pay-as-you-earn employee of a major corporation but wants to know how much her company car is going to cost us each year. And so you build up these personas that tell you, can they get what you need from the service? We build up anti-personas. These are people who don't want to get something positive from your service, but people who want to break it, break in, do something. So we might talk about common fraudsters, people who want to get money out, people who want to hack the service in various ways. So here's an example. Um, so uh, Han Solo uh, is motivated primarily by money, but also works with the Rebel Alliance for various reasons. He's capable of using common tools as well as modifying tools on the fly. He doesn't want to be caught and takes an effort to avoid head-on confrontations. And we do things like this. We work out... What resources does this attacker have available to them? If you say that uh, you know, a typical fraudster has a low set of resources and low technical competence capability, then they're not going to break encryption and TLS. If you use it, it will work. On the other hand, if you're worried about a nation state, you might go, well, actually, they might be able to break this kind of encryption. I need another level of, of protection. It helps you make decisions as a team. And you can put these up on the, on the walls. And the team can look at them. When they look at stories that are coming up, they can go, what would Han Solo do to this story? Or not Han Solo, but you know, what would my anti percent do? We also come up with uh, misuse cases. So these are um, just like um, automated testing, like your use cases, where you write things in, uh, you know, you might write them in Selenium or Cucumber or something similar, but you can write misuse cases. You can write things that say, if I submit a uh, receipt over here and then submit, uh, change my name to this and then issue it, the check will be sent to the wrong place. Or if I uh, deliberately put in a weak password or try 5,000 passwords within a certain amount of time, this should happen. And you can run those automated tests to ensure you didn't break anything in the system. So your developers get a lot more confidence that their system is secure. And all of this comes down to understanding riskier stories. What is the problem with the service? Um, you can apply these ISO 27001 controls. These are very technical terms that security people use. So when there is a risk, if you say, I want to send money to people in my uh, service next week, you can say, well, what am I going to do with that risk? I can avoid it by not doing the story. I can mitigate the risk by putting something in that prevents bad people getting in there. I can transfer it to someone else. I can just say, look, we're just going to use GoCardless or PayPal or, um, or somebody like that to do it, and then it's their risk, not mine. Or you can say, actually, I'm okay with accepting the risk. That's fine. The, be the business value is better than the risk that we're going to run. And if you say you're going to mitigate, you have a set of things you can do. You can decide how to deter people from doing it, prevent them. You can just correct the issue, detect it later, and, and so forth. You can recover by restoring from backups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can record those decisions against the stories. And you can record deferred security debt. So like technical debt, you can start saying, I know that we've added a new feature that makes it slightly easier to break into our system. And we're going to come back to that in a few weeks' time. Um, and that's always slightly worrying because you know technical debt lasts forever. No, as I think we were saying earlier, um, uh, no no decision is quite so permanent as a temporary fix, um, uh, and it's true for security debt as well. Um, one of the things I would say is security bugs are not, even, are not evenly distributed. Change control boards who have a security review will tend to say we need to review everything, but actually you might only want to review things that are touching your login process. 
because that's where most of your security bugs will be, or anything to do with passing tokens around, or cryptography. Those are areas where the security team should be more involved, and they don't need to worry about the fact that you're moving the RSS icon from one place to another, or that you've added a new um, uh, thing there. But the key thing is that your product manager is in control. The final thing I would say, and it's delving slightly from some people's view of Agile into, into what we call DevOps, is that regular releases reduces risk. That classic Agile thing, which is if it hurts when you do something, do it more often because you will find it's smaller, it's easier, and it hurts less often. Unpatched vulnerabilities is the source of most data breaches. Every study over and over and over again shows that when people are breached, it is because of a known vulnerability. They already knew that the thing was broken. They could have been told they could have fixed it, but had not been able to patch. The average time to patch a known vulnerability, if Microsoft releases a RDP vulnerability, the average time to patch is 69 days. However, that is weighted towards quite a large number of people who can patch within seven days. The real time is somewhere in the region of 200 and something days. So hackers discover there is a flaw. They start scanning the internet, looking for things on that flaw, and you've given them 200 days to actually uh, deal with that. Um, we'll ignore that. It's about Drupal. It's not very interesting. Um, I worked on the www.gov.uk government website. Uh, we fixed the Heartbleed bug within two hours of no noticing that it was there. Um, the AWS fixed not only their estate within an hour, they started scanning their customers and saying, we've deployed a thing in front of your estate that protects you, but you are now vulnerable. So uh, there's a great Twitter thread. Uh, these slides will go up. There's a great Twitter thread that you can read about what they actually did there. But within an hour, they were able to deploy a fix. If you have a system that takes you ages to do deploys, you won't be able to do that. The way that we're able to do that, the way AWS does that, and the way that GovUK is able to do that is because we have infrastructure as code. Do you all know what infrastructure as code is? Hands up those who've done infrastructure as code. If I said Puppet or so forth, there's a few more people. So we have things like this. It is code that literally says, this is Puppet actually, um, this code that literally says if you want to configure a Varnish server, you'll make sure it's installed, this file will exist with these contents, and so forth. This code can be executed over and over and over again, and it will always make sure the machine is in the same state. The nice thing about that is it gives us infrastructure as testable code. We can write tests about it that tell us that the, um, uh, that the system works, that we haven't made a mistake, that we haven't rolled out a change that breaks anything. We also write tests like this that go to certain uh, pages and check that they return the right information. So this is a smoke test that makes sure that we haven't broken anything fundamental while deploying it. And it means when we're dealing with patches that we can do things like work out what machines are infected really easily. Because we have that configuration database. We know that's rolled out every couple of hours um, or pretty much consistently all the time. So if I know there's a new version of Nginx, this is what the configuration looks like. And the important thing here is we have this thing here that says ensure version, dollar version. And that variable will be set somewhere. So this was this was quite a long time ago. But on my computer, I could go and say, this was actually a very long time ago now, 144 is a really old version. I can go look through the entire thing saying, what is the Nginx package version? And know that. It is uh, generally set to 146, apart from in the old precise servers. The front ends are on 146, the back ends are on 145. I now know exactly what version is deployed to every one of my computers in my uh, web estate. If I want to update the machines, I can just update the test YAML, set the version to 147, which is the patch, deploy it, and run all those configuration tests and know that I didn't break anything, that none of the configs changed, none of the things have had to happen. What if I only want to do some machines? Maybe I only want to do the front ends, because nobody can touch the back ends, and so I can just deploy it to the front ends. And I can reduce my area to just a certain number of machines. And having done that in test, repeating it in production is exactly the same process. You just change the prod one and say, run, and it runs in production. No change control process, no need for anything else. You've got absolute confidence that your change will do what you intended it to do. So. As was stated earlier, like stories are the best way of, of dealing with this. Um, I went to go meet a government service very early on in my career. I went to go meet this government service, and uh, they released code once every six months. Or at least that's what they told me. They did, they did two releases a year. Um, they did uh, one release uh, in, uh, in January, uh, December time, and then one release in June, July sometime. Um, when I quizzed them, I discovered they did not do two releases a year. They actually did six, because they had a three-month change freeze before the releases went, but there would always be some bugs that they detect during the testing process. So after the main release, two weeks later, they would roll out their fixed release that would fix all the bugs they found in the change freeze. But they also did an emergency release two weeks after that every single time to fix the bugs that the bug fixes had introduced. 
So they did six releases a year, but they didn't do very many. The aim was um, uh, one every six months. I spoke to the release manager who said every six months, one of his most important jobs is correcting the documentation because none of it's accurate at the point at which he does the release. So he said, it says, you must release to these eight machines. And he's like, there's definitely 10 now because of the thing we did six months ago. So he'll update the documentation, release to 10 machines. It was never up to date. At that time, the GovUK team that I was working with released eight times per day. So we were pushing out eight updates every single day to all of our systems. That means that in one day, our release engineer had the equivalent of four years of practice from the other government department. When things go wrong in the middle of the night, when things break, do you want the person who, over a week, has managed to do 40 releases, over a month has done 130, in six months has done 750 releases into production, or do you want the person who just did one six months ago? May have been their first release ever. They may not know the system, they don't know what's changed, but now it's 2 a.m. and somebody is shouting at them that they need to make sure that thing is fixed and they have to do the release. If you are releasing regularly, it becomes common practice, it becomes safe, it becomes easy. So in summary, does Agile make us um, more secure? I would say that security doesn't actually work in its current form. We like to say that it works, but the massive increase in continuing breaches constantly just tells me that it's not working. It's not doing what it says it sets out to do. The simple systems, such as microservices, are more secure than uh, other systems. And the Agile pushes us towards simple systems. You aren't going to need it. At software development means that we tend to have simpler systems. That if security works with the team as an enabler for a team that is empowered, that they will be better at making security decisions, and that regular releases reduces risk. Which brings me to the vision that Agile doesn't make us less secure. Agile makes us significantly more secure. So I think that is dead on time. Um, uh, as you can uh, contact me by email. Uh, my Twitter account is at the bottom. Do feel free to tweet me. And there are some questions. And don't forget to rate the session. <laughs>